Okay. So pretty much th we left off here. We left off maybe like a slide away, but I thought I would just kind of pick up here. Um, it, the idea is that, that the immune system, although I'll show you that it can be actually very potent in blocking cancer, the immune system actually seems to be a culprit in a lot of things. It causes problems. And in particular, uh, it's this long-term activation that we've talked about several times, right? right? Okay. Yeah, they're having more fun than you. Okay. So, um, so the immune system is divided up into two components, right? There's the innate immune system, which is comprised of cells that essentially don't need to be educated in order to recognize something foreign. They encounter it, they eat it up, they secrete nonspecific things that turn things on. And the adaptive immune system, which is typically limited to T cells and B cells, the lymphocytes, they actually have to be educated. And that's actually the technical term that's used, right? They get educated and they learn what's foreign and what belongs. And uh, that's um, uh, the way that they then recognize foreign things. And to use a, a, a fairly pertinent, relevant thing, that's what happens with Ebola, <laughs> right? So clearly you have been following the Ebola stuff, I hope so. Um, it's uh, going to be, it's already devastating, but it's going to be worse. Uh, and so what happens with Ebola is the, the, the innate immune system is not very well equipped to handle virus infections. Uh, and although they can clear some viruses, our bodies essentially take time in order to recognize uh, and learn about the specific proteins on the virus that they're supposed to attack. And, and that takes too much time in the case of Ebola, right? So it takes several weeks. You can see it says B and T activation. I don't know. It's kind of white on gray, so you may not be able to see it. It'll show up in the video. But in any case, these T cells and the antibodies that B cells produce take time in order to be produced because of that education step, right? They have to learn what to recognize. They essentially have to be shown what to recognize, and then they have to proliferate and produce things. And in the case of Ebola, by the time that happens, the patient is already too sick for it to work, right? So uh, in in what they're doing in Ebola, one of the things they're doing is actually taking the blood and purifying or at least using the sera, right? You guys know the difference between blood and plasma and sera? So, so blood has all the cells and stuff in it. Plasma has the cells taken out, but it's got cl clotting proteins. And sera is what's left when you clot. And... So what they're doing is taking sera from patients that have recovered, those that didn't die. By that time, these people probably have antibodies that can fight uh, and slow the progression of Ebola, block the infection. Okay? So that's the adaptive immune response. And the adaptive immune response is also responsible uh, in part for reacting against cancer. Okay? <laughs> And so, so as we said, there's this chronic inflammation that occurs with cancer. And this is the slide I believe that we left off on, right? We had talked about uh, previously that hepatitis, this chronic inflammation of the liver, is associated with hepatic cancer, that helicobacter, a, a bacterial infection that infects the, the stomach and the, the, the upper side of the small intestine is associated with gastric cancer, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis with colon cancer, even gingivitis, even chronic inflammation of your gums is associated with oral cancer. 
So again, it's another reason uh, why you should floss, right? And uh, a reason why people should have good oral hygiene because any kind of chronic uh, inf inflammation seems to be associated with cancer. It's a very tight relationship now. And the, the flip side is that things that interfere with cancer, such as, such as the non-seroidal anti-inflammatories, of which aspirin is one of those, uh, and uh, COX-2 inhibitors, cyclooxygenase-2 inhibitors, aspirin is a cyclooxygenase-1 inhibitor, and then some of the newer drugs are COX-2 inhibitors. Um, Hey, I see your picture. I can't see you, but can you see the slide or? No, we can see you here. Okay, so just hang up and let me see if I can add you to the... Skype online. My video call. Hey, Jay. Hey, Jay. Okay, your screen. Hey, uh, I don't know what happened. Don't know. I think it's the internet. Okay, but you can see this. Yes, yeah, it's loading. It's loading now. Okay. And we can see it now. Okay, so I mean, essentially, I was just blathering on like I normally do, saying that uh, the inflammation is really tightly connected and that things that block inflammation like like aspirin uh, which is an NSAID a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and the COX-2 inhibitors like Vioxx, Celebrex, right, the new generation, those things also reduce cancer risks. Okay? Which are the COX-2 I'm sorry, say it again? Uh, which are the COX-2 inhibitors? The COX2 inhibitors are like Celebrex, the the kind of new the new generation pain medicines. Vioxx was one, but they pulled Vioxx. Ibuprofen, I think, maybe a COX2 inhibitor. You know, Advil. Yeah. 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 About the immune system that causes problems, right? This is this is I think pretty much right where we left off last time. I think. And, and one thing is too much of a good thing. So the immune system is supposed to produce reactive oxygen species, for instance. These are, now I can see you. Hi, everybody. And uh, so reactive oxygen species are good. They're, they're toxic. They can destroy bacteria. You can use them to destroy uh, cells that are infected with viruses, but if you have reactive oxygen species being produced for 20 years in your liver, then that's a very, very toxic environment for DNA to be replicated, right, and for things to be uh, produced. Same thing with these secreted factors. Early on, if you have an acute problem, you want your immune system to be producing growth factors and stimulating, but if it's something that goes on for a long time, someone with colitis or Crohn's disease or something, and it lasts a long time, then you're in, you're in real trouble. So the results of having the immune system on for a long time tend to be things that can end up helping the cancer. So one of those is tissue remodeling which sounds like uh, it's a weird term, but if you think about it, uh, tissue remodeling means breaking down and building up stuff. And when do you do that? So a good example of tissue remodeling that you're very familiar with is the menstrual cycle, where the entire lining of the uterus is broken down and shed and you have to rebuild the whole thing, right? With vasculature, everything. And so that's not an uncommon thing. Certainly tissue remodeling has to happen during wound healing. When you cut yourself, you have to fill in that gap with new tissue and you have to have a blood supply for that new tissue that you just made. So tissue remodeling, angiogenesis, these things are normal processes that have to happen in order to recover from an injury or an illness or even an infection. 
But if you have it happen a lot and a long term, this or if it gets hijacked, the tissue remodeling that allows blood vessels to form in a, in a wound healing is not good if you're allowing blood vessels to form and they're feeding a tumor. Right? So, so if that remodeling is occurring in the vicinity of a tumor, it can cause real problems. Um, and the, the good guys, these, these factors that are produced by the immune system, also tends to activate transcription factors in the cancer cells, one of them being a, a protein called NF nuclear factor kappa B, which is a transcription factor. And I mentioned it earlier, it's a bad guy. Uh, you could go out dressed as NF Kappa B at Halloween. You'd be very scary. Uh, so, so it's it's a very scary uh, transcription factor. It causes a lot of problems, and people are actually working to uh, try to interfere with its activity. Uh, it tends to keep cells alive. So, cancer cells actually share their stress. So. When you have uh, drugs or hypoxia, steroids uh, present, growth factors, taxol, chemotherapy, uh, the, there's a lot of things that, that are going on inside the cancer cell, and they seem to interact uh, with other cells in their area. So essentially, if you stress a cancer cell, Right? This tumor, e, for instance, stress of the endoplasmic reticulum can alter immune cells in the area. So the cancer cells are there. They're in a stressful environment. We looked at that. They don't have oxygen. They don't have nutrients, right? They're in a terrible acidic environment. They tend to panic. And when they do that, they can release factors that, that cause the immune system to behave in an irregular way. That makes sense? Okay. As as another example, macrophages, right? This type of immune system, the macrophages that are part of they're essentially the bridge. They're part innate. They're able to eat things, but they also are the educators for T cells and B cells. So they have a, a, a part in both. And you can have uh, macrophages that are called M1 macrophages. They're essentially grouped by their physical properties and the proteins they make. And they can produce octin species. They can prime T helper cells. They can have anti-tumor activity. But in the wrong environment, they can essentially be corrupted and work for the tumors. Again, they don't do it on purpose. It's not a plan. It's just the environment around the tumor can force them to behave in a way that does not help the person. They produce cytokines that can facilitate angiogenesis, the, the, the intrusion, invasion of blood vessels, and uh, they're going to help the tumor. Okay? And it's not just macrophages. So, so lymphocytes, uh, here is a, a, an article, the expression of a single viral oncoprotein in skin is sufficient to recruit lymphocytes, the, the, the T cells, right? These are CD4 and CD8 positive T cells. But again, they're not working against the tumor. They're actually producing things that are growth factors for the tumor, and they're facilitating the tumor growth. Okay. Here's, here's another one. Uh, these are cells that are myeloid-derived. That means they're of the same lineage as uh, the, the other myeloid cells, right? Bone marrow derived cells, blood cells. And, but they're, they're actually suppressor cells. So the immune system is really tightly regulated. We'll, I'll show you a very specific example in a moment or two. But it has things that turn it up and turn it down. And so, so essentially, uh, the, the cells in the area of this tumor, of this forming tumor, right, in this colitis, this inflammation, these cells are shutting down the positive immune system. They're suppressing, suppressor cells. 
they are shutting down the immune system in that area, and that's going to promote the growth of the tumor cells and the growth of the tumor. Okay. And so there are a bunch of different, and this is not to be memorized, again, not that you would have memorized it because I'm not testing you anyway, but um, Yalda would memorize it. Yalda, don't memorize this. <laughs> so uh, there's a bunch of different suppressive ways, right? So, so this isn't a global immune suppression. When you think of immune suppression, you may think of AIDS, HIV. These people, they have no immune systems against lots of things. This is a very localized suppression. It's only in the area of the tumor. A good example of, of another way this, when this happens is during pregnancy, right? Because the baby, for a female who's pregnant, the baby is half foreign, right? Half of her, the, or his DNA comes from the father, right? And we know men are completely foreign, right? So... You have these foreign thing growing inside you. Why isn't a baby rejected by the mother? It should be, right? It should, your, your body should say, this is foreign, we need to get rid of this. But the immune system is actually suppressed, right? In the area of the baby. You knew this, right? Why is that? So, I mean, it, it's both, it's, it's cytokines and, and other immunosuppressive things that are produced by the placenta in part and by other cells in the area that essentially say, hey, no immune system, leave me alone. Well, what happens in the area of a tumor, you get that same kind of atmosphere. It doesn't go far. It doesn't mean this person's going to get a cold more likely or get an infection. But in the area of the tumor, there's various uh, cell cell things and protein secreted things that actually make the, the area immunosuppressed, right? So they're, ab they're able to avoid the immune system. And again, I'll show you, I made a beautiful diagram for you. It took me hours to make this. So, so you'll see uh, an example of uh, immune evasion uh, in the immune system. Now, I'm kind of giving the, the immune system a, a bad rap here, right? And saying the immune system helps uh, tumors. But that's not always the case, right? So the immune system can and does kill cancer cells. So we know that about one in two men and one in three women will develop cancer in their lifetime. That's current in the U.S., right? That's current sort of statistics. But it's likely that pretty much everyone develops cancer and you just eliminate it, okay? It happens all the time. We have 100 trillion cells. It's hard to keep them all in line. Some of them strike out on their own. You get an early event, but those cells get recognized and eliminated, okay? So what we're talking about when we're talking about cancer, by definition, we're talking about the cancers that have been able to evade the immune system, or we wouldn't see them. Does everyone get that? Right? So it's not that the immune system fails. It's that we see the cancers that make it pass. Okay? And, and there, there, are, there are several different... Um, types of cells that are involved in this. Cytotoxic T cells, T lymphocytes, are able to recognize and kill cancer cells. And I'll show you, that's what we're gonna talk about in a moment. There are cells that are called natural killer cells, kind of like Woody Harrelson, you know, the natural born killer, right? So, so, so these are natural killer cells and uh, they patrol the, the body all the time and they're looking for these changes that you see in cancer cells on the cell surface that marks them as abnormal. So for instance, sometimes cancer cells will start to reproduce and put on their surface proteins that are normally only found in babies, right? Or during development. And so these natural killer cells see this and they think, whoa, what's up, right? And they'll, they'll kill those cancer cells. The role of antibodies is not as clear in a natural system. There are multiple different antibody-based drugs, one of which we'll talk about, that have been developed to fight cancer. The role of antibodies, naturally occurring antibodies, in the, in the development of cancer is not, not as well studied, right? 
Uh, we know, for instance, that you can vaccinate someone against HPV. It prevents cervical cancer, but it's not the cancer that it's against. It's against the virus, right? So, so that's different. Okay. And like I said, this is a relatively new paper. This is from February of 14, so it's pretty new paper, in, in which they essentially show that fast ligand-mediated immune surveillance, you can reread this as extrinsic apoptosis, right? This is cell death caused by T cells, right, from outside, is essential for the control of spontaneous B lymphoma. So if you knock out the ability of these T cells to bind to and kill cancer cells by interfering with this extrinsic pathway, these the, you get much more B cell cancer. Again, we only see the ones that make it through. That is that clear to everybody? So, so, I mean, what I said, I mean, the, the bottom line, right, is that, is that the cancer, it's not that the immune system is ineffective and it doesn't fight cancer. It does. But we see the cancers, the ones that get big enough to cause us any problems are the ones that are able to evade that. Mm -hmm. Okay? That, that makes sense? That's clear? Yeah, because, you know, it's, it's very easy for people to think like, oh, what's wrong? Why did I get it? What's wrong with my immune system? Well, maybe maybe it worked fine. It, you know, it, it just this one made made it pass. Just for a chance. Yeah. So here is here is the example I wanted to tell you. I would say that uh, if you guys are interested in cancer research or when you are interested in oncology, so when Mariana is an oncologist and she's treating people or, or Yalda is messing with people's heads, um, right? The, one of the biggest fields now in cancer biology and oncology, one of the biggest things now in all of it is what's called immuno-oncology, right? This is the interface between the immune system and cancer. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you one example. So this was an article that was actually from Emory. Uh, it just so happened, I'm not pimping Emory here. It just so happened that, 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 that this guy works here. Okay, I am pimping Emory. I take it back. But this guy works here. His name is Rafi Ahmed. Okay, and he is an immunologist. He's not a cancer person, but he got into cancer kind of sideways because he was trying to understand about control of T cells. And I told you they can be turned on and turned off. We said, right, that tumors can turn them off. And so he was trying to understand that. And then he got kind of sideways into tumors because he realized that tumors were able to turn off uh, these things, right? So what's going on in cancer? And uh, more importantly, and this comes from the New York Times, if you've never read any work by her, you should write her name down. She's a great uh, science writer named Gina Colada, which sounds also like a good drink, um, right? But, but uh, Gina Colada. What is his name again? The, her name is Gina Colada. It's in the slide, but you might not be able to see it. It's in the byline in the article. So, the question that's breaking, the, the, the articles are about this, okay? So, this was, this was a paper that, uh, I don't even know when it came out, June 2012. So, this is, this is older research, and what they're looking at is the ability of cancer cells to avoid being killed, but more importantly, how can we overcome that and cause those cancer cells to die? And one of the reasons that this is so exciting, and I'll, and I'll try to explain this in a way that you can all follow. You'll interrupt me if I don't. But cancer is very unstable. We know that. We talked about hallmarks, right? Cancer is unstable. So when you treat it with something that's the same, right? You give someone chemo. You're going to kill all of the cells in that population that are sensitive to that particular thing. But the chances are that there's some in there that are not going to die. 
And that's the that's the rub, right? I mean, that's why people die. It's not that we don't have treatments. It's that the cancer resists the treatments, right? Ultimately, people people normally respond, but then they, then it comes back. So the thing that's very exciting about the immune system is, and you know this already just from your life, the immune system adapts, right? You get exposed to something. Might maybe you get sick the next time. You don't get sick, right? Your your body learns. And it, it's able to adapt. And so if you have something that adapts, that's a great thing to fight something that's changing. Okay. So here is an example. So in, in this diagram, I'm assuming this is big enough for you guys to see. We have a big blue ball. That is, that is a T cell. Okay. Can we see this on here on the screen? Yes. Okay. So the blue ball is the T cell. The white thing underneath is a cancer cell. Okay, and the T cell has on it, you may be able to tell that I drew this myself. Uh, the T cell has on it this red thing here that looks like uh, a, a Y kind of thing. This is a receptor, and this receptor is, is sort of named backwards. It's weird because it sort of does the opposite. It's called Program Death 1 or PD1. Okay, the red thing, PD1. Program death one. Are we all on the same page? Okay. And be, it's not, it's named kind of backwards. And the reason I say that is because when PD1 binds to a, a protein that's put on the surface of the cancer cell, that's this kind of green, greenish box, that represents something called PD1 ligand. Okay, there's actually two of these. There's ligand one, ligand two, right? So there's a couple of these. And I told you before, uh, ligand is something that binds to something else. That's kind of a generic name. So this PD-1 ligand binds to the PD-1. So the tumor cell down here is talking to the T cell. And when they interact this way, that causes this T cell to shut down. So this is how the tumors can cause local immunosuppression, right? That T cell comes over raring to go. It's going to kill that cancer cell, but when it hits that PD-1 ligand, that turns that, that, that T cell off. The fancy term for that is it makes it anergic. Without, an means without, ergy for energy. Anergic. It becomes quiet, energic. I got your Where did that PD1 come from? Like where it, it? It's 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 a gene. It, the gene is is a nuclear encoded gene inside the tumor cell. So they just produce that and show it on their surface. And every cell does that. Well, I mean the the tumor. Not every tumor cell does that. Of course, all cells have the same genes, so presumably they're all capable of doing it. But it seems to be pretty common amongst a lot of different cancers. Okay, you ready for my magical thing I made for you? Yes. Okay, hold your breath. All right. So the yellow, the yellow wise represent a new therapy, a drug. Okay. So so the yellow wise are antibodies. These are antibodies that are synthesized in the laboratory and they are against the PD-1 receptor that's on the T cell. Why would you do that if you want to treat a cancer patient? Doctor Ono? Yes. You're uh, you're breaking up your voice. That's not true. I sound wonderful. <laughs> okay is it better yes yes okay so the the yellow yellow y's represent antibodies right and okay. they're designed to stick to this pd1 receptor on the t-cell right okay. this this is our on off switch right 
And when these antibodies bind to this receptor, it can no longer bind to the PD-1 ligand on the tumor cell. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? It, it blocks it from binding. I mean, it's like jamming something into a keyhole, right? You can't get the key in there. So, so this, the, the PD-1 ligand, the thing that's, I should have taken this away for you, but it, the thing that would be right here can no longer stick right and so what the 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 result of this drug is that it causes the the t cell to remain in the on condition right it doesn't get turned off because it's unable to bind to that ligand like it did previously does that make sense so this this doesn't happen when that happens right Okay, so I wanted to show you, this came out September 4th, yeah, do you guys, you guys have a question or, okay. But what would happen if you use, uh, we use this therapy and then, I don't know, maybe alternative treatment to enhance the immune system, would that help yeah, I mean that's exa that's that's exactly what they did, right? So so the whole goal here was to block this negative regulator, and and here is here is the 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 article from uh, about it, right? This was actually from the from the Merck website, September fourth. So this was just a month ago, right? So they received accelerated approval, right? So this went through very fast. And the reason you get accelerated approval is that your drug shows great promise. And so this is the first FDA approved immunoregulatory thing, something that's going to block, something that blocks the immune system, a negative regulator of a negative regulator. So it gets confusing to think about, right? But if, if this thing is blocking something that's blocking, it's helping. And so this is something that turns on the immune system. And so essentially uh, what this is used for initially is in uh, melanoma, right? Metastatic or melanoma, skin cancer. And how expensive is this therapy compared to, to the most... I would assume that this is crazy expensive. Yeah. I don't, I don't actually know the, the cost. I mean, but... I'm going to go with thousands of dollars per dose. So, so this is a monoclonal antibody. The, the brand name is Keytruda, right? Keytruda is the brand name. The generic name is Pembrolizumab. And every drug that ends in MAB, right? All of the drugs that end in MAB, that stands for monoclonal. That means one single type. AB is for antibody. So MAB is a monoclonal antibody. So this is something that was a mouse antibody, and then I think it was a mouse antibody, and then they replaced the back part of the antibody with human components uh, via recombination so that your body doesn't reject it. Right? It's a little, they call it a humanized monoclonal antibody. Yeah, because it's part mouse, part human. Does that make sense? So this is the first one, and it got very rapid approval. I know for sure if you guys are involved in cancer in the future that the immune system is going to play a much bigger role. So this doesn't directly attack the cancer, right? This, this thing doesn't even bind to the tumor. This binds to the T cells to allow them to remain active. It works completely indirectly. It's not attacking the tumor itself. But you should be excited about this because this is a huge breakthrough. The first one approved, and I think it's one of what's going to be many. Yes, it's amazing. Okay. Now, so so what what are all of these other cells? that are surrounding a tumor. I told you last time when we started that tumor, the cancer cells are just a small fraction of the cells in the tumor. 
something like 1% or even less, even a fraction of a percent of the cells are the actual carcinoma cells, the cancer cells. So what are all these other cells doing? And it turns out that, that uh, and remember, all of the other cells, everything other than the cancer cells is referred to as the stroma, right? The stroma. Okay? And so as just an example, the fibroblasts that are in there produce a huge array of uh, different uh, cytokines, growth factors like insulin-like growth factor, enzymes that break down the, the matrix, the matrix metalloproteases, um, all kinds of things that cause proliferation that, that uh, lead to the blockage of apoptosis, that lead to changes in structure. And why do cells have to change their structure if they're cancer cells? Because where are your breasts when you wake up in the morning and where are breast cancer cells? We talked about that, right? So cancer cells move. Normal epithelial cells stay put. And so we need to alter the area around them to essentially lay down a path and you have to enable the cells to be able to move, right? Essentially, you've got to give them some feet, okay? And allow them to move. And that's a lot of what the stroma does. They're producing a lot of cytokines that, that alter the environment and make it more likely for those cancer cells to be able to survive, to be able to avoid death, and to be able to move. Okay? And it's not, it's not essentially one-way signaling. So the carcinoma cells, that, which are typically epithelial cells, right? We said most of these cancers are epithelial origin. And they're producing uh, growth factors like platelet-derived growth factor, which affect fibroblasts or macrophages or myofibroblasts, these contractile fibroblasts that line blood vessels. And the macrophages are talking back. It is a two-way street. Okay, so it's important to realize that these macrophages aren't doing anything wrong. Again, there's no plan. There's no master plan. They don't want to do something that hurts us. They're just responding to normal signals. The end result is that if you respond to signals coming from an abnormal cell, then you may end up helping them instead of hurting them. Uh, so if you enhance immune system and some cells like the mic macrophage can hurt well help the, the cancer cell instead of killing the cancer isn't there some risk in I, yeah, I mean, so the idea, is, of course, the idea is with the T-cell, with the PD-1, for instance, that treatment, the idea is to it very specifically prevent T-cells from becoming inactivated that should be attacking. Can you have unintended consequences, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, only time will tell, really. They're too new, right? There's no one that took it 10 years ago. There's someone that took it 10 days ago. <laughs> so, so, you know, we, we, we really don't know. I mean, but that that's definitely, a, uh, 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 you know, definitely something to think about. Yeah. So, uh, Again, there is, there is lots of two-way signaling. This is not intended, again, for you to, to memorize. It's just to show you the variety of different signals. So here there's at least, I would say, at least a dozen or so signals that are produced by fibroblasts, by epithelial cells, by the cancer cells, and by the stroma themselves, right? Yalda, what are you doing? Did you yawn? I'm sorry. Did you yawn? Get out. Get out. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm She's hypoxic. Okay. So there is a new there is an there is a new a new way that cancer cells can communicate, which has actually pretty recently been discovered. And it's something that you probably did not learn about uh, previously. I didn't know about it before. 
Uh, and uh, so this is this is actually I have more slides on this than I probably should because I think you probably never heard of it, and so I thought it would be neat to share it with you. So. Tumor cells, in addition to, and this is also a way, by the way, that's being used to detect cancer, right? Uh, people are looking for these in blood to detect cancer. So it's being used both to monitor treatment, detect cancer, and uh, hopefully maybe interfere with cancer. So the tumor cells release these small little bubbles, right, vesicles, little membrane-enclosed bubbles that are called exosome. Exo, of course, means out outside like exoskeleton and zone means body so external bodies these little things that leave the cells and float away okay and it turns out and this is some pictures by the here in a uh, prostate cancer these are melanoma cells these are prostate cancer cells you can see these exosomes forming okay these little micro vesicles before they bud out and then here you can see a B cell, an immune cell, and what it's doing is taking in, I don't know if you can see, I can't really draw on, oop, that doesn't help. <clears throat> this, this B cell down, oop, I can never show you. This B cell down here, which is drawing in the little, the little vesicles. And it's bizarre, okay? So no one knew about this. It's a different way of communication. It's pretty r recently been studied. People have known about them, but really didn't understand what was going on. And these, these micro vesicles, these exosomes, can, it turns out they can, they can copy a lot of, they can carry a lot of stuff. So here is what happens. You have a secreting cell. You package in these, uh, in these little uh, micro vesicles, which either bud directly off or go into uh, vesicles inside the cell. Either way, they get released, right? These exosomes get released or micro vesicles get released. But what happens is they get taken up into nearby cells, and then you can release things. Proteins, RNA, it's amazing. They can actually control the behavior of nearby cells by packaging RNA and sending it. So that's something that we really never thought about before. RNA is very easily destroyed. So they exchange? Well, it, it's a one-way trip. Right. So, yeah. So the, the, the cancer cell in this case, what we're interested in would be a cancer cell. This is a generic diagram. But in our case, this would be a cancer cell and this would be a nearby stromal cell. It could be an immune cell. It could be a fibroblast, anything. But these cancer cells can release bubbles, if you would, these these little vesicles that go they and the reason people are looking to try to detect cancer with these is because these little exosomes end up in your bloodstream and float around in the body so so these rnas or proteins that are in here can actually alter the activity of the of the thing of the of the the recipient so i put here some examples for you that it could be a good thing. So here are, this is an old paper, right? 13 years old. Uh, Tumor-derived exosomes are a source of shared tumor rejection antigens for CTL cross-priming. So CTL means cytotoxic or cell-killing T lymphocyte. So essentially what they're saying is these exosomes carry things in them that can then educate T cells to recognize the cancer. Okay, so that, of course, would be a good thing. But uh, here's another one. Regulation, this is from 2014. Regulation of immune responses by extracellular vesicles, right? And people are actually uh, basing therapeutics on this, and, and maybe it's helpful. But it seems like the more we look at cancer, that these exosomes, these extracellular vesicles, tend to promote survival and proliferation of the cancer cells by shutting down immune system cells. So here is another example from uh, 14, enhanced shedding from amoeboid, meaning that they're moving. They're moving like amoeba. They're crawling. 
amoeboid prostate cancer cells affects the tumor microenvironment. So now we don't we have to worry not only about the proteins that they produce, but about these little bubbles, right? Here is another example. Exosomes, they lead to decreased sensitivity of lung cancer to cisplatin. This is a DNA damaging platinum containing chemotherapy drug. Cisplatin causes crosslinks in DNA, right? So it locks the DNA helix together. And this these exosomes block that. Okay? Maybe it influences patient survival. So tumor-derived exosomes are enriched in this, this NP delta, NP73. Delta means deletion, so this is a mutant form of a protein, promotes oncogenic potential in acceptor cells, and correlates with patient survival. So more of these exosomes, shorter survival. It yeah. I'm sorry, you had to speak loudly. Um, um, because it spreads more, the, the, these little things like are carrying RNA from the cancer and then it's getting to the bloodstream, so it can affect more parts of the body, right? Yeah, presumably. And, and protein. They carry proteins and RNAs. Yeah, presumptively they could have systemic effects. Yeah. Okay, so again, what are these exosomes doing? Uh, there, there is some evidence. This is a, a paper from 2012 in which they were looking at melanoma cells that are producing these exosomes, uh, and it can lead to alterations in the bone marrow. They can uh, alter, uh, change the remodeling of the extracellular matrix, lead to inflammation, uh, increased vascular permeability, pro-angiogenesis things. So uh, they tend to, in general, exosomes from cancer cells tend to be pro-cancer, not pro-immune response. Okay. Now, if we, if we kind of go back again and we look into tumors, one of the, the, the characteristics of cancer is that it's chaotic and cancer tissues are disorganized. So normal tissues, the cells are lined up together, uh, they're organized, the, they secrete the extracellular matrix and then they align themselves with it so they lay down their own foundation, right? Their own guideline, if you would, and then they hold on to it. But cancerous masses lose that. The normal proportions of cells are altered and their organization is uh, really messed up. So here we have uh, a picture of a normal prostate gland. Here is the, the connective tissue, the sort of those uh, contractile uh, fibroblasts, the myofibroblasts. You have your basement layer of cells. And if you look closely, I don't know how closely you can see this, you'll see the dark, the nuclei, these dark purple balls here, yeah. and then the cytoplasm. See, they're lined up like that, like columns. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. And the nuclei are toward the bottom. See that? Yeah. Okay, that's called columnar, and this is what you get in a normal secretory epithelium, right? You have your basement cells that are lining the organ. The prostate, that's what it does for a living. It makes prostatic fluid, right? It's a lubricant and other chemicals that is pre are present in semen, right, other than sperm. So it provides the fluid for the sperm to live, right, and swim for their lives, right? So... Uh, prostatic fluid, that's what it does. And so it's a secretory tissue. Really, it doesn't look all that much different, honestly, than a breast duct, right? Same thing, right? That same organization. You need a channel and you secrete the fluid into here and it flows down, okay? Here's what prostate cancer looks like, right? So none of us are pathologists, correct? But I think you don't have to be a pathologist to see that this is hopelessly screwed, okay? That, by the way, is the scientific term for that. 
That is, that's what pathologists say. They look at it and they say, wow, that's hopelessly screwed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you, ever, if you ever see that on a path report, you'll know. Yeah. So, so the, the tissue is, is very, very disorganized. You don't have the right amounts of tissues. You tend to have a lot of connective tissue, and I'll show you another picture of that in a minute. It's one of the things that makes tumors palpable. It's one of the reasons why you can feel a tumor. When, when women do, when, do breast self-exams and they, they're feeling for a mass, right? You, you're taught to do the exams in rows like this. I'm doing a breast exam for you, right? You do like this, okay, in parallel rows and you feel for a lump. The reason that you feel that mostly is because there's a lot of connective tissue. It's not the cancer cells you're feeling. It's all of those other proteins that are laid down. Right? There's too much of it in a tumor, and I'll show you a picture in a moment. So this shows you what the basal lamina is supposed to look like. Uh, the, the, the cancer cells and stromal cells, in particular fibroblasts, secrete. They're called fibroblasts because they produce fibrous material, fibroblasts. Blast is something that makes something, right? So they're producing lots of fibrous proteins, and they lay this down, and it acts, it, in here, it kind of looks like a mattress almost, like bed springs. You got your little grid, and then you got your stuff underneath. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a sheet, a sheet shape. And this is a close-up of, of a basal uh, lamina or basement membrane that lines all of our tissues. And you can see on this side, on the left side of the picture, it looks like a nice solid sheet. And then it's kind of broken down over to the right and you can see more of the individual fibers, right? But it's, it's a very tightly woven structure that organizes the tissues. And this is what it looks like. Importantly, if you look at the top, it allows for the cells to hold on. This is why your breasts are where you left them the night before, okay? Because those cells are holding on tightly, right, to that basal lamina, to each other, which isn't shown in this diagram, and to the other parts of the extracellular matrix. They're essentially welded together, right? Normal cells are not happy floating around. They want to hold on to other cells. Only blood cells are happy floating around. Okay. Blood. You didn't hear me? Yes, uh, the blood cells and... Yeah, I was saying the only cells that are healthy and happy when they're floating around and not attached to some other stuff are cells in the lymphatic system and the blood supply. Oh, right? okay. Every other cell, if you pull it away from, from holding on, is going to die. Okay? They don't like it. So this is this is uh, uh, micros. Uh, uh, I think maybe in some time 